Hi there, welcome to Boxing Deep Dive. I'm Lyndon Hosking, and great to have you along for another episode of Dream Fights. And uh, we've got a massive episode for you in store this week. Um, I'm going to bring in my co host, as always, and they're warmed up from the classic fights. We've got Grant Tazzy Brown, Pistol Pete Maniatis, and Mike Altamora. How are we going there, fellas? Going good, as I said, mate, I kicked Peter's ass last week, so I'm feeling pretty good, mate. <laughs> and Mike, you're back amongst it now, mate. You've had a week just to find the, the range and timing. Are we uh, we're back to full uh, fight fitness this week? Oh, definitely. You know, one of the interesting things is, so I reshared our graphic for Joshua and Bruno, and, of course, we all chose Anthony Joshua last week. Yeah. Can you believe in the Ultimura Instagram universe, 43 votes to Anthony Joshua, 55 to Frank Bruno. Wow. So 55 wow. of my followers think I don't know shit about boxing. Wow. The plot thickens here. I was going to get into it in a second before we announce the next fight. The poll, the Instagram, the, the Boxing Deep Dive Instagram poll, about the same amount of votes um, in total. Just want to um, mention that all four of us went for Anthony Joshua last week, by the way, quite comprehensively, I think, from memory. This is what the pollsters had to say. 82% for Frank Bruno, 18% for our man Anthony Joshua. So are we, have we got it wrong, boys? Do we actually think we know boxing or we don't? What do you reckon, Tazzy? We don't, we don't know boxing. <laughs> No, no, I, think, I think the people in our poll need to stop smoking whatever they're smoking because they ain't no shit about boxing. <laughs> what do you reckon, Pete? Well, so you had about 100 votes. So what did you say? So I was about, what, 55 to 43 or something, was it? Yeah, look, you compare errors, it's very oh, hard. Yep. Go, okay, Pete, you're all right. No, I was going to say, it's very hard to compare errors, but Frank Bruno yeah. was a very popular fighter. That's why a lot of people would have voted for him. Agreed. Everyone loved Frank Bruno. But his big hiccup was when he did step up, he'd get beat. Yeah. So whichever way you look at it, where Joshua's a bit more solid and he's won Olympic gold medals. So that, yeah. that did it for me. But Bruno was a big, big puncher and Joshua's a touch chinny. But Bruno's a touch chinny as well. But... It just would have been a great fight, but I, I like Joshua and the fact that he's a bit bigger, uh, you know, maybe boxed a little bit more smoother, less robotic, not much more. They're both pretty robotic, but mm. it would have been enough to beat him. I, I just, especially in a big fight, Bruno used to freeze up. Yeah. The Witherspoon one, I still have nightmares about. And Bone Crusher as well. So, yeah, no, I agree. But, Mike, it, it sort of went against the grain a little bit because normally when we do these polls, the current day fighters are the ones that normally people vote for because, of course, a lot of them are only familiar with probably the last 20 years of their life, I saw, or 10 years of, of their lives. But this was an interesting right. one because it was all the it was the old time, well, I say it's old time, but oldish time uh, in Bruno, which was very surprising. So maybe he's a lot more popular than what we actually thought he was. I think it's two things. I think the one, nostalgia plays a part. A lot of people are nostalgic about the fighter Frank Bruno was. But the other part is... I think it just shows or reflects how much Anthony Joshua is kind of slept on and disregarded by mm. a lot of people in this era who feel like he was just a built world champion, which I don't believe to be accurate at all. Mm. I think, you know, a lot of these fighters, unfortunately, unless they're at, say, the Canelo level, Triple G, a Chocolatito, we just seen with another spectacular performance on the weekend, unless you hit that kind of pound for pound recognition, Fighters that take losses in this era, they're almost demonized, whereas the losses for fighters in the past are, are forgiven because of the nostalgia. So mm. that's what I think it is, but I wouldn't be changing my pick. I'm Joshua all the way. Yeah, no, I agree. Tazzy, before we get on to the, the, um, this week's one, it, 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 Mike's right, isn't he? Because especially the Anthony Joshua situation, he lost to, obviously, um, what's his name, Andy Ruiz. Um, and he said that he won the rematch, obviously, but he said after that there were so many people telling me you should retire. This is a guy that was up to that point undefeated, lost in an upset, and was pretty much told that it was, it was career over. Yeah, it's pretty much to do with this generation of boxing. I mean, mm. the, a, a loss is so big to people's eyes where back in the day, they, all the greats took losses and they yep. fought again a week later. I mean, mm. you know, whether it was Henry Armstrong or Ray Robertson or going back to the you know, Benny Leonard's or the Grebs, I mean... 
a loss wasn't a big deal. And I mean, it, you know, like now, one loss or two loss and you're done. It's not not, not true at all. It's mm. uh, unfortunately, you know, in the Mayweather era, yeah, his fault, mind you. But so much is put on that having that zero. Mm. So yeah, I mean, you know, the people that know boxing know a loss sometimes can do your water good. The mm. average punter who knows nothing at all. Yeah. I'll go along them lines at a time, so it is what it is, mate. Mm. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Go for a Do you think people defending their records, as you mentioned, at zero, do you think Floyd Mayweather's a big supporter of that that's brought the new breed to protect that zero because Floyd protected it like his virginity was on the line? Do you think that's what caused all this? Um, I don't know, like... I mean, he, I mean, he done what he done for his career. I mean, he, you know... I'm not he, saying, I'm he, saying, he, he's the one that yeah. pushed his for because De La Hoya before that, all these other fighters before that that were pound for pound guys, Hagler, Leonard, that Copper lost and had moved on. It didn't mean as much. And Duran, all of them. But Mayweather comes in, he protects it so much and then does exhibitions now so it doesn't affect his zero and still makes 10, 12 million bucks. Then you get guys like Jake Paul and all those YouTubers come in. It, I just felt it, it just wasn't... I, I felt that sort of built the long thing that if you lose a fight now, it's like the end of the world. Yeah, where... probably, probably, probably right, Peter. I mean, look, I'm not going to knock, knock his legacy because, I mean, he was a great fighter and he did fight. You know, some great fighters, you know. A, a lot were at their best in the times. Not, not always not always opponents were passed over the hill. But I like Floyd. The talk of Floyd, I like Floyd. At, you know, lightweight, super featherweight. Um, but as what's going on now, I'm against all the YouTube bullshit. And mm. I mean, I'm not, he's making money, so I'm not making the 12 million. But yeah, I'm, for boxing traditionalists like we are, I'm against all that. I suppose that generation have seen, have sort of know, know how much the zero is. It was for you. So yeah, I guess it has sort of, hasn't helped this generation. Um, I'm surprised how this generation when I speak to even young kids, 18 year old kids, and I talk about Australians like Jeff Fennick and don't even know who Jeff Fennick is now, mm. like these young guys. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, mm. it's so much of a gap between my era and this era now. It's actually crazy. Mm. Mike, before we get on to this week's dream fight, just on the Mayweather argument, to think that, to think the fact that, you know, the, the zero meant so much to him as um, compared to a lot of others is that in the second half of his career was more about the business being a businessman rather than a fighter. Yeah, I think that I mean the Mayweather syndrome undoubtedly affected the sport where everyone was chasing that unbeaten record. But where it comes into play is from the networks and a big contributor to it in that in that era from say when Mayweather was thirty five and zero and onwards was HBO. So. HBO's investment in fights was based on guys' records. And you're seeing, you know, fighters, a 24-0 fighter going against another guy, 18-0, who couldn't fight a lick, mm. but it was being rewarded. And, but it dates back a little further, too. If you remember the George Foreman era, the, the 90s era of heavyweights, where if, if you could build a white heavyweight, an American White Hope heavyweight to 15-0, there was a half a million to a million dollar payday there for you against... Foreman, Tyson, whoever it was that you'd be fed to. So I think it's something that was created more on the network side over a period of time. And then it come to the forefront with Floyd. I feel like currently we're going back to the system of how it should be that your record is assessed on its merit, mm -hmm. not based on just a sheer number. But it's, it's going to take time. And I think that, like I said earlier, I think eras... People in their own era are always harsh on those that lose within the era. Mm. So Anthony Joshua will be more appreciated in 10 years' time than he is right now. Yeah. While Good he's point. lost in this era, he's going to be discredited no matter what he accomplishes. But once he moves on, he'll be respected. And look, it almost happened with Canelo for a few years. He bounced back well from the Mayweather loss. But people were disregarding Canelo's whole resume because he had the loss to Mayweather, which... It's just completely absurd. So mm. yeah. I do think we're coming out of it and we're going to be headed to better times in the sport, which is the main thing. And I think uh, you mentioned Chocolatito earlier on. He's probably a classic example of yeah. it that 
five years ago, or four and a half years ago, I was there when he was knocked out by the tie, and it was almost career over. And here we are, he's back on top and um, number one super flyweight in the game. So, and will be probably assessed as the greatest super flyweight of all time. So, so yep, good point. All right, well, we better go on to this week's uh, episode, Pete. It's on you. I was going to call you Peter Pac-Man Maniatis there because um, your man is up. Again, I think it's the third or fourth time he's been up, and I reckon you've picked him nearly every time. But anyway, who have you got? <laughs> We've got, of course, the eighth one of the world, Manny Pacquiao, up against Terence Crawford, the undefeated, probably away from Canelo Alvarez, a pound for pound star of today. See, Terence Crawford is destroying fighters at the moment. Cal Brook destroyed him. Cal Brook went out and destroyed Amir Khan. So, Cal Brook. Has got, you know, he's not that bad, to, but he's just, I mean, we see Crawford destroy everyone. He destroyed Amir Khan. Everyone he's been up against, he just seems to destroy. He's undefeated. Brilliant mover, switch hits, does everything. An athlete with a great promotional company. And they, but they both would have been with the same promotional company, so mm. this fight would have taken place if Pacquiao was 10 years younger. So it would have been a very interesting fight. Pete, is there an actual, before I get to Tassie, is there an actual reason why it didn't take place? Because these were two welterweights who, like, unlike all the others who were with PBC, were actually with top rank. It's amazing that the fight, because these are only a couple of years apart, and in reality could have actually fought. Well, they were going to do it before the Horn fight. Before Pacquiao oh. was going to fight Horn, they were really in talks for him to fight Crawford. But, um... For one reason or another, look, and Crawford, even now, Crawford doesn't have any appeal as far as numbers go. Yeah. He's a brilliant fighter, but for some reason, his numbers are down. I mean, mm. Bob Aaron keeps saying, when he fights, I'll lose a house. And Bob's a pretty honest type of bloke. He doesn't have numbers. Crawford's not a media guy. He doesn't get himself out there. He's sort of an old school guy. And uh, his numbers weren't stacking up. So if Manny was to fight someone like Crawford, who, who's a, a brilliant fighter and doesn't bring anything to the table as far as numbers go, it's a hard one to pick because mm. you might as well fight, let's just say, someone that's a Mexican that's a touch easier and you're going to get three or 400 pay-per-view buys from Mexico. Do you think Tim, Timothy Bradley was in the same bracket as Crawford? Though he was probably less marketable than what Crawford was, really, and he got three attempts at money. He was less dangerous. Timothy Bradley wasn't as good as Crawford, let's be honest. No, he wasn't, but he yeah. also wasn't as marketable either. And when you bring a fighter to the table, you look risk versus reward as mm. well. I mean, what, what he brings as far as risk goes and, yeah. and, and what's the reward going to be. And, mm. and Crawford was all the other way. It was massive risk and no real reward. You're going to bring everything to the table. Let's play poker and we'll play for $1,000 and I'll bring $990. You lose yeah. 10 bucks. Yeah, no, fair enough too. So Tazzy, we've made this for the WBO welterweight title. I probably could have been anywhere between lightweight and welterweight, I'm assuming, because they both won <laughs> titles all along all, yeah. all along there. But yeah. we've made it for the MGM Grand Garden Arena over 12 rounds. Um, what are your first thoughts on it? I, I remember back when they were mentioning the fight. They both were top rank at the time. And... Um, I don't know how sure they was then about throwing him in with Crawford because, um, I mean, you know, he had a had him probably looked good for a while before, you know, before he lost the horn. And then obviously he comes back and beats Thurman. But I think, um, like Peter said, the risk and reward thing was there. And um, but yeah, look, uh, I mean, you know, you give it, as you see, you have this in any division from lightweight onwards. And um, Crawford was undisputed at lightweight. And then obviously won the version of the junior waterweight, then went up to waterweight, and Pacquiao, we all know what he'd done, just ra you know, ravaged through divisions one by one. And yeah, mate, so look, man, this is a good argument. It's a great, great fight, obviously. Um, trying to look at the both in their best, if you can. Crawford's probably at his best right now. And Manny, um, obviously, is now retired after the loss to the Cuban. So, yeah, mate, this is a, this is a, a great fight. It's another two, a Hall of Famer versus a future Hall of Famer. Hmm. And, yeah, it's, um, mate, I believe Crawford's a real deal. We all know Manny was the real deal. So this is a good fight. Hmm. Mike, before we get to you, I'll just bring up uh, the record of Manny Pacquiao. You can see there, 62-8-2, and two, 39 KOs. Too many titles to, to list there. Although one thing I will say is that he skipped five divisions out of that, and I'll let you comment on that in a second. I've just put, rather than put his most memorable fights, I've pretty much put 
um, all uh, you know, the fighters that he's fought numerous times. It's, it's an amazing record. And Mike, uh, as I said, first of all, five divisions skipped. He started at flyweight, ended up at super middleweight at one stage, but um, in there, skipped five divisions along the way. Well, it's, it depends how you perceive the skip. I mean, you could say that he skipped featherweight, as Pete knows, but he was the lineal featherweight champion of the world by taking out Barrera. Mm. Then there's other weight classes, like at lightweight, he beat David Diaz. David Diaz wasn't the best lightweight in the world, mm. but he has the world title belt to reflect it. So it's a bit of a balance. So he, he stopped off in most weight divisions. The only ones he really skipped, per se, is when he went from 112 to 122. Mm. And that's because he, he missed weight so dramatically, defending the, the world title at 112. So um, I think that Pacquiao, to me, naturally was probably a, a, a lightweight in the end. I think anything he accomplished above lightweight, you really have to put down to what an absolute unbelievable athlete he was. I mean, mm. I was in camp with him for the Brandon Rios fight, and I remember for that fight... He was eating over a kilo of rice a day just to maintain his walking around weight every day between 139 to 142 pounds. And keep in mind that the fight was at 147. So mm. it really reflects how small Pacquiao was. I think that, you know, whatever he weighed in on, on fight night for any of those bouts at welterweight, usually his weight might have even decreased by fight time. So, you know, I think that you, you got to really look at everything above 135 and treat it with absolute respect because anything you accomplish above that was just, it's really a superhuman feat if you look at it. Mm. Yeah, and Pete, uh, on top of that too, you can see the fight with Ricky Hatton there. He also was at um, the Ring Magazine or IBO or whatever, at Lineal Champion at, at Junior Wilderweight as well. But as Mike said, he skipped, I think it was a super flyweight, he skipped bantamweight, he skipped super featherweight. And junior light, junior no, welterweight, no. I think, was the other as well. No, no, he fought at junior lightweight, and he fought at lightweight. Did he? He didn't win a world title though at super or junior lightweight, though, did he? I don't think he did. He won world titles in eight different weight classes. Yeah, if but I don't think he actually won a go. world title in that division. I don't think, but yeah. It, it depends if you class the IBO as a world title, no. which I do because. Ricky Hatton held the title. Mm. And obviously the featherweight one was a lineal one with Barrera, which outweighs it because Barrera was the number one guy at the time as well mm. in that division. So um, it just depends how you look at it. But mm. yeah, Matt, he won world titles in flyweight, super bantam, featherweight, junior lightweight, lightweight, super lightweight, welterweight and junior middle. So he did win the junior lightweight world title. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, but either way, Tazzy, no matter how you gauge the linear titles or the Ring Magazine titles or whatever it was, this guy is just uh, you know, another you know marvel of the world, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, you know, he had the great fights against the great Mexicans, Barrera Morales and Marquez, and they're all very blessed to be in the same era, a bit like the Fab Four. Um, he really ramped. He really went through. Obviously, obviously Hatton and the more, the most impressive win for me was the Cotto win and the Margarito because you know you th talking about the size and the greatness of Cotto and obviously just the size and the you know and that of Margarito. So they're two of the best, probably the two most impressive wins for me, which I couldn't believe he'd do it being such a smaller guy and all that. But I mean. You know, records don't lie. It happened and Manny stopped him, obviously. But I think the Cotto Margarito wins and probably the two of the wins that I really stand out to me later on. I'm not talking about the early ones with Rare and Rallies. I'm talking about, like, around the water weight, light like middleweight division. Um, I actually didn't think he could do it at the time. And he's just a wrecking ball. He just mm. know where this guy was going to stop. Was he going to go to middleweight? Was he going to mm. go to fucking heavyweight? Yeah. You just don't know when this guy was going to stop because of the weight. You're not traditionally meant to go up so much, but he did. Mm. Yeah. Mike, do you think um, that Pacquiao's career, I suppose you could make an argument for uh, Henry, uh, Henry Armstrong, um, we've ever seen a fighter with such an amazing, diverse record with so many different weight divisions, so many massive fights over those weight divisions, so many belts included. 
I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. How about you? No, I mean, mm. and and look at look at this era of fighting. That's that's the thing. Like you look mm. at this era of fighting. Even if Canelo went to heavyweight and won a world title at heavyweight, it still, mm. in my view, wouldn't be comparable because the jump from Pacquiao started one hundred five. I know he was still a teen, but to go from one hundred five to win a recognised world title at one fifty four is just it's outrageous. And then further to that, the longevity. Mm. Look at, Pete, how, how long was he pro? 20, 25 years, was it? Yeah, I mean, close to 25 years. Amazing. Yeah. Like, that, that longevity is just ridiculous in any era, let alone mm. this one where, you know, supplements, where there's guys on, um, you know, recovery programs, all of that, which also make places you at a greater disadvantage that there's going to be greater athletes to be able to do what you do. Mm. Like, what he's accomplished in this era... You can't say we'll never see it again because we we always talk about the greats like that. Oh, you won't see it again. And then the next Pacquiao comes along yeah. or the next yeah. great athlete. So we may see it again, but I think it, it's just phenomenal. It's mm. just phenomenal what he achieved. Yep. Well, let's get on to his opponent, uh, Terrence Bud Crawford. You can see there, 38 and no, 29 KOs. There's one uh, world title from lightweight up to welterweight. Uh, a few of his most notable wins there as well. Most recently, uh, the Sean Porter, Cal Brook, and Amir Khan. So, Tazzy, you're you're a bit of a uh, Terence Crawford fan. What are your uh, thoughts on how he stacks up against the Pac Man? Yeah, it's all about styles make fights. I think he stacks up very well. Um, you know, I mean, you know, he's a slick boxer. He switches southpaw orthodox. He can punch. He can box, he can move. He's got a real ruthless streak in him, I believe. If he hurts, he wants to get out of there. He's got that sort of nasty streak. And, you know, I think he's nice and long. I think he um, causes Pacquiao a lot of problems. Um, am I giving a pick here, Melinda? No, not pick? yet, mate. Not yet. No. No. But I think it gives Pacquiao a lot of problems. I mean... Um, you know, we could say he has a 41 life pack here. It's probably a fair call, but mm. he's fought some great fighters around his time. The only other great fighter he hasn't fought yet is Spence, and I believe that he really wants to fight. I believe it's more the Spence team that are sort of taking their time. But he's beaten anyone pretty easy. Like, he, mm. you know, his first, we first saw him stand out against like Gamboa and that back in the day, and and then he unified the lower division, and he's sort of beaten everyone fairly easy. He just stopped the unstoppable Sean Porter with his last victory. So um Crawford's got a lot of a lot of um yeah could could be a bad style for for many. But it, yeah, mm. it's a it's a good argument. Yeah. Pete, do you think that um Crawford needs a Spence type of fighter to get that to, I know he's probably never ever gonna have the respect of a Manny Pacquiao, but do you think he needs a Spence fight like a Hearns and Leonard and, and you know Curry, McCrory, these types of guys needed each other at welterweight? Hundred percent he does, and I think he beats Spence. In my opinion, I think he'll beat yeah. Spence pretty easily. That's just the way I feel. I think if he moves up to the junior middle, he beats Charlo, he beats all of them. I mean you you know, you put Terence Crawford in with Tim Zoo at junior middle, who, who would you be putting your money on? Let's be honest. Mm. Let's be honest to you guys. I mean, this guy he, he's supreme. He boxes orthodox. He's just the southpaw. He's got a great chin. Never really been both much. Um, and he's got decent power. I mean, he, he's pretty much, you know, he, he, he buzzed up Jeff Horn. He, the referee stopping the fight when he did actually did Jeff Horn a massive favour. That was going to end up being disastrous if it kept going. So, I mean, the guy's a legitimate future Hall of Famer. Tazzy summed it up. There's no doubt in the world about that. He's won already three world titles in three different weight classes, and there's no doubt he can move up to 154 and win a world title. Hmm. After that, I don't know if he can move up to middleweight and win a world title, but speaking of him right now, right here, up against, say, Manny Pacquiao and Manny Fort, Cotto and Manny Fort, Ricky Hatton and Manny Fort, De La Hoya, it would have been a real interesting great fight because this guy's a real deal. Mm. Let's not really underestimate where this guy's at. I mean, he Crawford's an absolute superstar. It's just he hasn't got the fan base to sort of back it up. Mm. He's got the performance, he hasn't got the fan base. So 
it, it, I mean, it, there's a whole lot of steak and not no sizzle. Where before he did a lot of sizzle and no steak. Here's the opposite. Yeah. His performance is amazing. Mike, do you think that um, that Crawford has gone from lightweight to welterweight? Obviously, do you think he's got the ability to, like PT, go to super welterweight slash middleweight? Yeah, he walks around at almost 180 pounds. He's, wow. He's deceivingly strong. I remember when the fight was made with Jeff Horn and a lot of people within Australia were saying that Jeff Horn had a chance to go in there and outmuscle him. And anyone that had been around Crawford realises that at 35 and even 40, we probably didn't see the best of him because he was always sucking a lot of weight off his body. Mm. And he naturally grew a lot as... As he evolved from his mid-20s to early 30s, he naturally grew a lot, become a lot more physically stronger. He's in exceptional condition. And anyone that's ever fought him, anyone that's ever sparred him has always said the same thing, that not only is he slick and slippery, but he's physically an absolute powerhouse. He muscles you around, knows how to control his weight, especially when he's in the orthodox stance. Everyone said he's, he's crazily strong. Mm. And that's probably because he's got the wrestling background. So... I've got no doubt that I, I look at fundamentals in boxing. Great fundamentals. Look at Chocolatito, and I mentioned him on the other program. Great fundamentals can see you fight unnaturally high in weight. And Crawford, to me, at 154 wouldn't be unnaturally high in weight because he would probably rehydrate at 170 pounds. So mm. I think it's possible. He's got all the tools, all the skills to beat anyone at that weight. Yeah, some big fights there for him as well. Well, Pete, that was your choice this week, so we're going to let you kick off the action. Who wins and why? Okay, as we mentioned before, Crawford currently now up against Manny Pacquiao, that 2009 era where he beat Cotto, Hatton and De La Hoya. I see the fight starting real quick because Manny's obviously a very fast starter. I see Manny start landing some real good combinations on, on Crawford and getting his respect. I see then Crawford trying to push Manny around and bully him and, and winning some rounds. By about round four or five, I see the fight pretty even. Crawford having his moments, but Manny also landed some big shots and, and getting Crawford's respect. By about five or six, I see Manny start getting his input a lot more and starting to find his range and really land some good power shots on Crawford, so it's come towards, in my mind, pretty similar to the Cotto fight where Manny lands a big talent shot and drops Crawford, so around the sixth round. By about round seven and eight, Crawford goes into more of a passive style, knowing that Manny's power is a lot more than what he anticipated and his speed. And I see around nine, round ten stoppage to Manny Pacquiao retirement. For Crawford okay, winning he nine stops nine. Crawford. He stops Crawford, yeah. Okay, in what, ten rounds, okay. okay. Like he did Cotto, like he yep. did Dillahoya, like he did Hatton, like he did all of them, he stops him. Okay. All right. One for uh, Manny Pacquiao, 10th round stoppage. Tazzy, over to you. I've got a feeling I know the answer here, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to disagree with my Versace wearing Greek friend right here. How <laughs> I know that was going to happen? Um, we all know that he wears Philip <laughs> Mental Underpants the better than all time. <laughs> Um, look, you know, it's a great fight. I mean, Manny starts early, like he does, buzzing out. He probably, you know, surprises Crawford early with his speed and his footwork, but he does that bouncing around like he does and in and out with, you know, a few different attacks. So he probably wins the first few rounds. Crawford might find it a bit better in the orthodox stance or the southpaw. He probably plays around a bit till he finds where he wants to be, and I think he starts sort of slowing the pace down and catching Manny with some good counters. I mean, the thing is here, Tim Bradley, who I don't rate overly great, got a win over Manny, um, when Manny was meant to be... St Manny was still pretty good, but Phil Floyd ever beat him. So Crawford's way better than Bradley, and Bradley admits that. Bradley, they're friends. So this is the Manny that fought Bradley. Crawford beats him, and I'll go... Crawford stops him in nine or ten rounds. What, uh, do you, what do you think, though, Tazzy? Because I think we were sort of saying it's sort of a more 2009, 2010 version of Manny. Do you think that makes a difference? or Not really, mate. Okay. No. Nah. Okay. I mean, um, Stolers make fights. Cotto was a great fighter. But, you know, but, I mean, um, don't forget, Crawford, Cotto was after 
the massacre versus Margarito. Yeah. Hatton was after the knockout versus Mayweather. Crawford's unbeaten. He doesn't know what it's like to lose. Yeah. And his style to adapt, his length, his range. I don't think Manny goes that overly great against African American fighters, like Floyd Mayweather said. He, you know, like um, lost to Floyd, lost to Bradley. Mosey was old. I wouldn't count that that much. But look, I think um, Crawford Crawford catches him with a, a la Marquez right hand, and it's good night, Manny. Okay. So, 10th uh, round knockout. So, return serve at Pete there. That's one all. Mike, What? how do you see it uh, going? Who wins and why? Yeah, I think both guys surmise the early play of the fight. Crawford's always been an exceptionally slow starter, which is why you don't see a lot of first or second round knockouts on his record. It takes him, even with Cal Brook, it took him a few rounds to find his range and his rhythm. So, I think he starts a lefty. I think very tentative. Manny's the explosive starter. So, I could see Manny banking first, say, three three or four of the first four, three of the first four rounds, four of the first five rounds, something like that. I could see Manny starting explosively. Uh, the one thing that I'll say with Crawford, he's got versatility. So he's got the ability to guard up and go on the inside. Or he's got the ability to work as a lefty and get his jab, control the range, frustrate Manny. And I think that... If you look at prime Pacquiao, I don't think it's fair to look at Pacquiao with Horn or Ugas or even Bradley or that, because that's almost Manny slightly on the decline. But if you look at prime Pacquiao, even the Marquez fights, he always had a little bit of trouble with guys that knew how to counterpunch and knew how to set traps. And I think that uh, Crawford's an exceptionally intelligent guy. I think that this is just a fight where styles make fights. And it won't be easy. I think that Crawford will gradually edge his way back into the fight and pull away late, but I see seven rounds to five, eight rounds to four favouring Crawford, but it still wouldn't change my perspective historically that Pacquiao has accomplished considerably more and is the greater fighter overall, and you can never dis discount or write off great legendary fighters like that, but I just feel like Crawford's style would just be a little bit too tricky for Pacquiao if you're weighing it up. Well said. So a decision win to Crawford there. Um, so that's what that two to one for Crawford. Um, oh, I 100% I agree with all you guys in, in different ways. I think the fight itself would be so close. I think Manny would come out um, very fast as he does. I think Mike, you said that he'd probably win three or four of the first four rounds. I agree. I think uh, Manny would, uh, especially the 2009, 2010 version of Manny, I just think he was just, um, you know, just unstoppable. So I think you're right, Crawford would then come back into the fight, um, really even it up. And I think going into the 11th and 12th rounds, you could throw a coin in the air. Uh, I think um, after 12 rounds, I think it would be split decision. Very, very close. Wouldn't even surprise me if it was a draw, but we don't do draws on this on this program. So I think uh, Manny Pacquiao would eke out a very razor-thin decision. And it could even be disputed, um, I think. I, I think the judges would favour Pacquiao, but I reckon there might be a lot of conjecture about whether Crawford actually won. I just think it would be an amazing fight. I, I don't... You know, I, I don't really could see you know, either one winning, to be honest. I think either one could, could get the nod. But I just think in a really, really close fight, raise a thin decision to Manny Pacquiao. So that's two all, guys. Um, I'm probably a bit like you, Mike. I don't see a stoppage either way. But I think either way, it would just be so close. You just could not separate them. And as I said, I wouldn't be surprised if, if it was actually... A draw, but for me, the, the Pac-Man in a split decision back in 2009, 2010 versus the current day Crawford. So there you go, guys. I'm sorry, Tazzy. I tend to disagree with you every week, don't I? But I'm sure there'll be something coming up. Um, but I think I think we can all agree tonight. Probably our, one of our closest fights. I think, um, or at least according to Mike and I, you guys think um, Crawford and Pacquiao would stop each other, but. Either way, a brilliant fight. So um, just a closing word to you, Tazzy. What are your thoughts, just quickly? The part yeah, no, that we don't know shit about boxing. No, look, mate, you can't, you can't say anyone's going to decisively beat Manny Pacquiao. Hmm. You can't. So, I mean, look, you know, you can pull anyone from any era. It's going to be a great argument. So, I mean, yep. I think Crawford's special as well. I think he's a Manny Pacquiao-style fighter who's special for this era. There's only Canelo, I think that's, you know, the number one. But, I mean, Crawford's there. I hope that he gets a Spence fight. I hope that he gets his markability up. 
Yeah. I think he's a special fighter. I yeah. think um, I think he's probably the best African American fighter since Floyd. Yeah, and look, well said. I did actually say in my piece there that. I think one of the things that makes me lean just towards Pacquiao is that we haven't seen a um, Crawford in a Spence fight. Um, that's probably what swayed me in the end. And who knows, you could go out there and wipe Spence out and, you know, questions answered. But that's what sort of slight me, slightly um, tilted me towards Pacquiao. Uh, Pete, just quickly, what do you make? Two all? Two all, yeah. What a great fight it would have been. And I'm sure top rank would have put it somewhere at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, 80,000 people in it. And if Crawford did win the fight, it would have just been the crowning to him because he would have won millions of new fans over. It would have been the type of fight he needs. There's no one there for him to do that now. Who does he yeah. fight? I mean, does he move up to middleweight and fight Canelo Alvarez? If Canelo can make middleweight. Mm-hmm. He'd give Canelo nightmares at middleweight. Make mm-hmm. no mistake about that. Yeah. This guy's a real deal. And, and going back before we're talking about records, I think Canelo losing the Floyd early in his career was the best thing for him my opinion it just mm. made him the fighter that he is today so yeah. it's different we can debate it all we like but uh we're talking about the cream of the crop in both ways and pacquiao go down as a legend when you when i saw flyweight there you have to scratch your head again and think manny pacquiao flyweight yeah crazy five foot six mm. crazy yeah yeah final word to you mike yeah i'm just grateful that we never actually saw this fight and it lives in the dream fight concept because the whole era where it was discussed, and I know that it was, it's one of the bouts that would have been necessary really to cement Crawford's popularity and his legacy in a way, but it wouldn't have been fair to Pacquiao because it, it wouldn't have been the right reflection mm. of Pacquiao's capabilities, both as an athlete, but also at the weight. And so I'm, I'm grateful that even though it was kind of, it was, uh, it was a uh, somber moment seeing Pacquiao drop a decision to Ugas, I was still happier to see him go out on that note than getting obliterated by someone like Crawford because he's completely over the hill against an absolute star of this era. Mm. That's spot on, mate. Uh, exactly. Pete, we're back. To, uh, sorry, Tazzy. We're back to you next week, mate. I'm sure you've got a, uh, a ripper for us there. Who you got? I was going to do Dennis Hogan versus Carlos Monzo. <laughs> <laughs> Be a ripper. Who, who have you got? I've got Lenny Lewis versus Larry Holmes. Oh, I was thinking about that one today myself, uh, Lewis and Holmes. I reckon that'll be a ripper. Battle of the Jabs. Yeah, love it. Yeah, that was actually thinking about just today who my next one would be. So that was one of my top three. So, a ripper. I know Mike, Mike really wanted Wade Ryan and Harry Grebb. I'm going to let him use that one. I won't <laughs> steal Mike's pick. <laughs> And Mike, you're obviously off in a few weeks, so we'll, you know, hopefully you'll have another couple of cracks at it before you go. So start thinking about some more now. But uh, no, great, uh, great pick this week, Pete. Um, your man Pacquiao has ended up being too old. Um, we might get him across the line next time. Who's he been with so far? Costa Zoo, uh, Roberto Duran was the other one. Yeah, Roberto Duran, Marvin. Mm. I think he's fought everyone. Yeah. Tommy Hearns. Shannon I never Marvin Hagler. Shout out to the Filipinos. Hope you're all well and hope you don't hate me, but I don't really care. Yeah. Uh, exactly right. All right, boys. Well, thanks again for this week. Uh, make sure you uh, like, subscribe, share, all that sort of stuff if you're watching. Love the feedback. Uh, we've been getting plenty on the dream fights, so, which we love. So keep it coming and uh, look out for the pile on Instagram this week. Thanks, guys. Team Zoo. Team Zoo. Thanks, guys. <laughs>